It's now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. According to the Auditor General, this is the first time in the history of Ontario that the financial statements have been released without the Auditor General's opinion. An unprecedented action in Ontario's history and incredibly disrespectful to the Auditor General and the people of Ontario. But why, why was it released without the AG's opinion? That's the big question. Was it because she discovered the government has an $11 billion hole in their budget? Oh. Mr. Speaker, that includes $1.5 billion deficit this year. That's a lot of money. How will the government fill this hole? Is it going to be through new taxes, a higher hydro rates, new fees, or will the Liberals just cut services? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, let me begin by saying go Jays, go. You know, we were very clear yesterday that we have accepted we have accepted the Auditor General's numbers for this year. Um, we released the documents despite the divergence in accounting opinions specific to two pension funds between Treasury Board officials and the Auditor as part of our commitment, commitment to openness and transparency, because it was past the date, Mr. Speaker, when that, uh, that information was to be in the public. In the meantime, we will be consulting with experts on how our pension assets should be accounted for moving forward. Uh, officials will be engaging the expert uh, accounting community to support a full understanding of how that should be. I'm, I'm sure that uh, we have found ourselves almost in the same spot as we have almost every day at the beginning of question period. Uh, I would ask that uh, we, we try not to shout people down. I, I just don't think that's an appropriate thing to do, and I'll have to deal with that if I get a sense that that's all that's going to happen. Supplementary, please. Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. Every time it looks like the Liberals are hiding something, it becomes just a matter of time until they get caught. First, they tried to hide the cost of the gas plant scandal. We later found out that it cost over a billion dollars. Then the financial accountability officer caught the Liberals when they were supposed to use the funds from the fire sale of Hydro One for transportation, and then it goes to the deficit. And now the Auditor General caught them trying to hide an $11 billion hole in their budget. Mr. Speaker, I know our grade six students are failing in math, but I at least thought the government knew how to count. I expected better from this government. So my question is directly to the Premier, why has the Auditor General given your government a failing grade on public question. accounts? Directly to the Premier. President of the Treasury Board. Yes, thank you very much. And I'm very pleased to report that using the numbers uh, that were suggested by the Auditor General, what we really showed yesterday was that, in fact, we have beat our deficit target, Speaker, for the seventh year. <laughs> Consider that very important because it shows that what is happening with the province's books and with the province's fiscal performance is in fact we are managing our, our economy prudently and we are on target to reach our goal of balancing the budget in 17-18. We in fact showed that we had a, a projection originally of an 8.5 billion deficit. We now have a $5 billion deficit last year. We beat our projection, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. Sometimes I wonder what fantasy world this government is living in. When it comes to believing this government or the Auditor General, I'm with the Auditor General. This is the Auditor General saying that there is an $11 billion hole in the budget, and there is now an additional $1.5 billion away from balancing the budget. Why this government continues to ignore and disrespect the Auditor General is beyond me. And on the flip side, you have the government saying that everything is fine, that their numbers add up. The Auditor General is saying very clearly that they don't. 
Um, I, I made mention of it, so now I'm going to uh, start to fulfill it. The uh, Minister of Agriculture come to order, the Minister of Transportation come to order. And if I, and if I do hear any other any objections, I'll deal with those too, especially when I'm trying to get attention. Please finish. So, Mr. Speaker, instead of ignoring the Auditor General, how is this government going to make up the $1.5 billion in their current in their current budget? And additionally, Mr. Speaker, how does this government reconcile the fact that they're the first government in Ontario's history to release public accounts without the Auditor General's Question. opinion? It's beyond me. Uh, I'm going to ask that the members on the same side of the questioner not uh, interject as well. Premier. Uh, sorry, uh, President. Thank you. Uh, so let's go over this one more time calmly. When we tabled our budget in 2015, we projected that the 15-16 year would result in a deficit of $8.5 billion. When we tabled our budget, <coughs> the current year budget, uh, last spring, 2016, we said that the interim projection for a deficit would be $5.5 billion. And what did we actually achieve using the Auditor General's numbers? We achieved a deficit of $5 billion. In other words, we beat the budget target using the Auditor General's numbers by $3.5 the uh, member from Kitchener, Conestoga, from the order. You do have a wrap-up sentence if you want one. Yes, thank you. So, to me, it is good news that a we got the financial information Answer. out to the public, and b that we've beaten our deficit target for seven years. New question: The leader of the opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Yesterday, I saw firsthand how great the faculty, the facilities, and the students are at Yes I Can Nursery. I understand why the Premier fought passionately for funding this wonderful nursery nine years ago. And because of that, I can't understand why this Liberal government have turned their back on Yes I Can. The government has made a decision to cancel its annual funding. It has asked Yes I Can Nursery for a wind-down plan from the school. Without provincial support, Yes I Can may have to close its doors and Ontario would lose 130 precious childcare spaces. Mr. Speaker, why is this Liberal government turning their back on Yes I Can? Do they not appreciate this is their responsibility? Do not pass the buck. Do not say it's some other level of government. This has always been funded by the province of Ontario for the last nine years. It's been in existence for 26 years, helping children. Don't abandon them. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So um, far from uh, walking away from uh, this school, which does provide great service to uh, to kids, Mr. Speaker, and I have uh, I have been a champion of uh, of the program in uh, in North Toronto. It's a it's a great program, Mr. Speaker. And in fact, yes, I can. Nursery school receives three hundred thousand dollars a year, provincial dollars that flow to the city and flow to the nursery school, Mr. Speaker. That money continues to flow. The uh, the reality. The reality is, Mr. Speaker, that for some time uh, we have been officials in the Ministry of Education and Children and Youth Services have been trying to get the nursery school to sit down with the city Duffer officials and, come uh, and to work to come up with a budget and a sustainability plan, Mr. Speaker. Our provincial officials are perfectly willing to continue to sit with uh, with the nursery school, but, Mr. Speaker, there does have to be an Answer. open budgeting process. There has to be a conversation with the city officials. We're willing to Thank be you. part of that. But it has to happen, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier. The Premier continues to stress that yes, I can continue to operate and there's some flow through funding. That is not correct. According to the local Toronto City Councillor in the area, who said yesterday at the press conference, they said there is no city mechanism for this autism funding. There is no flow through funding that can be used. Your local Toronto City Councillor is saying you're wrong. This nursery is saying the Premier is wrong. There is only one level of government that is polling funding, polling $150,000 to take care of these children. It's not right. It's wrong. You fought for these children nine years ago. Why are you abandoning them today? Why? Please. 
be seated, please. Thank you. Bring her. The way funding for childcare and these programs works is that the money from the province flows to the municipality, and the municipality allocates those. No. Alloc the member from Dufferin Caledon, second time. Finish, please. Part of it, part of it is wage, wage subsidy. Part of it is for other programs, Mr. Speaker. But that money flows through to the municipality. That's why it's imperative that yes, I can sit down with city officials and, as I say, provincial officials who have been part of the conversation are perfectly willing to sit down with them to come up with a sustainability plan. But, Mr. Speaker, there has to be an open budgeting process. There has to be a sustainability plan, and that has to be done in conjunction Answer. with the city officials. And I know Jay Robinson, who is the city councillor, would be perfectly uh, would understand that that's the process that needs to happen. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, in the Premier's response, opening budget process or speaking lines, they're taking $150,000 away. That's why it's closing. You've got the local city councillor saying there is no Toronto mechanism. You have a Liberal senator come down from Ottawa who's passionate, Jim Munson, on autism funding, saying this is the wrong thing for the government to do. I just don't understand why this government continues to go after these families. First, they took families uh, with children with autism to the courts. Then they tried Tried to cancel the IBI funding, and now you have 130 kids, many of them, most of them, uh, children with autism, and this premier is abandoning them. No government is walking away. There's no municipal mechanism. There's no federal mechanism. The funding is provincial, and you are abandoning them. It's the wrong thing to do. Stop this attack on children with autism. Thank you. Social Minister of Education, your early years in child care. Thank you, Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I am pleased to rise today as the Associate Minister of Education to address this. First of all, I want to make it clear that our government is committed to ensuring that every child has access to the supports that they need. And this is not this is so important when it comes to our children during their early years. Our government is committed to giving our kids the best start in life. That's why we are making historic investments. We're creating another 100,000 licensed childcare spaces for zero to four year olds over the next five years. It's a historic investment. We have more than doubled the childcare funding to municipalities to over a billion dollars a year. That, that is why we, we are also providing funding to the City of Toronto, who then funds a number of local childcare programs, including the Answer. Yes, I Care Nursery School, at $300,000 a year. Mr. Speaker, we are committed to ensuring that a good program like Thank this you. gets the support that it needs. Thank you. Your question, the leader of the third party. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Yesterday, I asked the Premier about uh, people I met across Ontario who are struggling to pay their hydro bills. They have student loans that they can barely afford. They're paying for childcare that's only getting more and more expensive in this province. They're having to stop saving for their kids' education because their bills are simply too high. Speaker. The Premier said she has an enormous amount of sympathy. People don't need sympathy, Speaker. They need action. Will this Premier stop the privatization of Hydro One and all local utility companies? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, the, uh, the, uh, the reason that I talked about the sympathy is because we have taken action and we are taking action to deal with, uh, with the problems that people are facing on, in their lives every single day. And the, the leader of the third party began by talking about tuition. Well, Mr. Speaker, that's exactly why we believe tuition should be free for students from low-income families. Mr. The leader of the third party talked about childcare. That's exactly why, Mr. Speaker, we think there needs to be more childcare, particularly for the zero to four years, which is why 100,000 new spaces over five years is critical, Mr. Speaker. And the fact that we are moving to take the, uh, P the provincial portion of the HST off electricity bills to uh, further reduce bills for people in rural communities, Mr. Speaker, and to work yes, with small businesses so that they will have access to uh, conservation initiatives so they can save money. Thank you. All of that comes out of that sympathy, Mr. Sure. Speaker. Speaker, whether this Premier chooses to um, admit it or not, 
life is becoming more and more unaffordable for the people of this province all across Ontario. People are already struggling to pay for childcare, pay off student loans that they've been paying for a decade, and on top of that, the hydro bill keeps climbing and climbing and climbing. People don't know what to do, Speaker. They didn't vote to, tur uh, to uh, turn Hydro One or their local utility into private for-profit companies, and they cannot afford for that to happen. Will this Premier stop the sell-off of our hydro system in the province of Ontario? Mr. Speaker, underlying this question, um, it, as, as has been the case for, uh, for many months now, is an ideological position that argues that we should not build new transit, we should not make investments in new infrastructure by leveraging assets that have been owned by the people of the, Ontario, of the province for many years. Mr. Speaker, the Finish, please. That we shouldn't make those investments, that we shouldn't invest in new assets for the people of Ontario that are needed in 2016, Mr. Speaker. So we categorically reject that notion. We believe that investing in roads and And bridges and transit across the province is necessary. We're, dem we're demonstrating, Mr. Speaker, that those investments are creating economic growth, and we are going to continue to foster economic growth across the Thank province. You. Well, Speaker, even the Financial Accountability Officer says the Premier's got it wrong. You don't sell off a revenue generating asset to pay for infrastructure. It's the wrong thing. the facts, but what I really think the Premier needs to know is that all the families in Ontario that I've been talking to are telling us that they cannot afford their hydro bills. They're not alone, Speaker. The people I met in Kitchener and in Hamilton and Niagara Falls, they're not alone. It's happening everywhere. everywhere. They're seeing their bills go up and their paychecks are staying the same. They can't afford private power generation. They can't afford private power transmission. They can't afford private local utilities, Speaker. The Premier is not an innocent bystander in this mess. She can take action, and she needs to take action. Will she stop the sell-off of our electricity system in the province of Ontario? Thank you. Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, as the leader of the third party continues to try to conflate these issues, I talked about the need for us to make investments in infrastructure, and that's the asset discussion. If she wants to have the conversation about the electricity price um, uh, increases, Mr. Speaker, we are very aware that the investments that have been made in order to upgrade the system, in order to have a 90 per cent clean, emissions-free grid in this province by shutting down the coal-fired plants, by jump-starting a renewable industry, Mr. Speaker, that there's been a cost associated with that and the investments that we've made. And so, Mr. Speaker, we have put in place programs to address those challenges. So we've removed the debt retirement charge, Mr. Speaker, from people's bills. We put in place the Ontario Energy and Property Tax Credit. The low I think the message is being sent. Carry on. The low income energy assistance program, Mr. Speaker, the Northern Ontario yes, Energy Credit, and most recently we have uh, announced that we are going to be removing another 8 per cent, the provincial portion of the HST from people's bills. We understand that we need to take action, and we are, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. No questions? Questions also for the Premier Speaker. You know, if I was looking across the aisle at a Conservative Premier and they said to me that they wanted to sell off Toronto Hydro and every other local utility, I'd be disappointed, Speaker, but I wouldn't be surprised. People expect Conservatives to privatize. It's in their DNA. That's what they do. But that's not what the Liberal Party ran on, Speaker. People were deeply let down when this Premier announced out of the blue, out of the blue that she was actually going to sell off Hydro One. Now, 
Everybody is worried that she's actually planning to help privatize their local utilities. Will this Premier rule out any further sell-offs? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, you know, I believe that government exists to make decisions in the best interests of the people that it serves. I believe that if a government looks at a province and sees infrastructure that has not been invested in, Mr. Speaker, that has been neglected by subsequent governments, Mr. Speaker, that has not paid attention to the economic growth of municipalities and has not made the investments necessary, then it is up to that government to make those investments and to find a practical way to do that. That is what we have done, Mr. Speaker. We have seen a problem. We have addressed that problem. And what we're seeing now, Mr. Speaker, is Ontario is one of the leaders in the country in economic growth. That's government's responsibility, Mr. Speaker. You say that, please? You say that, please? Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, people work really hard to save energy, but at the end of the day, people need to turn on the power to cool their homes, to cook their meals, to do their laundry, uh, you name it, Speaker, people need electricity. So when they see the Premier selling off Hydro One and encouraging the sell-off of local utilities like Toronto Hydro, they see a government helping people at the top make a hell of a lot of money while everyone else has to pay the price. I, I, I need to put it on the record. Please withdraw. Thank you. Uh, they see the government at the, uh, helping people at the top, helping people at the top, making a heck of a lot of money, Speaker, while everyone else has to pay the price. People cannot afford it. Will this Premier stop her plan to sell off the hydro utilities in this province, as well as stopping the sell off of hydro? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The other responsibility that government has is to make sure that, as decisions are made, if there are people who need support, that we put those supports in place, Mr. Speaker, and to help people to deal with their expenses on a day-to-day -day basis. So, Mr. Speaker, we have, as I have said a number of times, we have put a number of programs in place, including most recently announcing that we're taking the provincial portion of the HST off people's bills. But, Mr. Speaker, our responsibility is broader that, than that. We have to look at other ways that people need support and other ways that they can participate in the economy. So, for example, Mr. Speaker, making sure that every student in this province has access to post-secondary education, no matter what their income, Mr. Speaker, that is a responsibility of government. That's why tuition will be free starting in September 2017 for 150,000 students from low-income families, Mr. Speaker. Those are the kinds of decisions that, taken in a package, mean that we are paying attention to people's needs on every day. I find it astounding that not once did this Premier say it's the government's responsibility to listen to the wishes of 80% of the people in the province who don't want to see their public assets sold off. The Premier wants people to believe that she has nothing to do with the privatization of Toronto Hydro, but she's already giving them, and the Finance Minister mentioned it yesterday, $100 million in tax giveaways to facilitate that. And she's planning more tax giveaways, Speaker, in the hopes of privatizing uh, Toronto's hydro, uh, hoping that, in fact, that move will take the attention away from her own sell-off of Hydro One. The problem is that there are people across Ontario who can't afford to pay anymore, Speaker, and instead of making things better for them, the Premier is trying to help herself Question. and her party yet again. Will this Premier admit that she's got no mandate to privatize Hydro One or a single local utility Thank and you. stop all the privatization now? Well, Mr. Speaker. You know, it, it makes me smile when the leader of the third party talks about helping us and our friends when she, uh, she references the decision around Hydro One. It was a hard decision, Mr. Speaker. It was a very difficult decision yeah. because it was, it was a practical decision based on a need that 
We, we saw, as we looked to fulfil our commitment to invest in infrastructure in this province, it was not an easy decision. It's one of those decisions that government has to take in order to, in order to be able to move forward. So, Mr. Speaker, we took that decision because we know that the neglect that infrastructure in this province had suffered over years, Mr. Speaker, the lack of investment, the digging of holes and the filling in of those holes, and the lack of maintenance across the north, Mr. Speaker, that had to stop. We had to find the resources to make the you have a You do have a wrap-up sentence. So we made that decision, Mr. Speaker, and the leader of the third party wants to conflate Answer. the issue of that decision and electricity prices. It's just not the case, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. My question is to the Premier Speaker. Halloween came early, it appears, yesterday when the government was so spooked by my question about the public accounts that, uh, that they treated us to a hastily held technical briefing, a press conference, and unaudited financial statements. This is unprecedented. It's never happened in Ontario before. It showed an $11 billion hole in their budget, and they tried to hide it by admonishing and undermining the Auditor General. Despite the Auditor's warning this past June of accounting changes in her, and then again in the 2015 Auditor's Report in Chapter 2, which I'll have one of the pages deliver. The government has been aware of this speaker for quite some time, and they want to know, as, as Ontarians, how this government is going to pay for it. Are they going to cut services to kids with Question. autism? Is it going to be even higher, hydro bills, right. new taxes, or are they going to trick us with all of the above? Thank you. Thank you, Gideon. Premier. President of the Treasury Board. Yes, thank you. And I think, uh, I think, Speaker, we should maybe go back to the beginning of the story, which is that uh, while, while there certainly has been an ongoing discussion between the public servants who do the accounts and the Auditor General, not, I would say, the politicians, for the record. While there's been an ongoing discussion, the first notification that we got that the Auditor General would not treat the pension, was rejecting the pension treatment which had currently been used for the last 14 years. I, uh, uh, the uh, Chief Government Whip is warned, particularly when giving an answer. Let's not uh, interject, please. Finish, please. Thank you very much. For the past 14 years, since 2001-2 year, the, uh, the, uh, the auditors of Ontario have approved a particular accounting practice for pension. Leader of uh, uh, that's the leader, the member from the. Team. Please. Uh, I'd like all of us to try to be helpful. The member from Leapy and Carlton, second time. Finish, please. We were we were faced with the situation Answer. that the auditor presented us on September the 13th with written information that she was rejecting the treatment used for the past. Thank you. New question. The member from Hamilton Mountain. Oh, sorry. Supplementary. 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 The member from Nipissing. Good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Yesterday, the Auditor General confirmed there's an $11 billion hole in the government's budget. But rather than cooperate with the Auditor General, the government went into full panic mode with a desperate news conference. Rather than address the financial waste and mismanagement, the government continues to break their legal obligations. They stonewall the province's independent officers. Speaker, there's a pattern here. 
and now they have released unaudited financial statements. No verification from the Auditor General. Speaker, people in Ontario want to know what this government is hiding and how it affects them. I ask the Premier, if the Auditor General refuses to verify their numbers, how can we ever trust anything they tell us? Yes, so what happened was we had advice from our, from our public servants, who we certainly hold in high regard that the books should be treated one way. We had advice from the Auditor General that the books should be treated another way. The way Cabinet resolved this was to actually pass a regulation that the Auditor General's treatment would be used in 2015. So I would point out that using the treatment that the Auditor General asked us to use, that in fact what we have is a $5 billion deficit, which is three and a half billion dollars lower than what we re originally projected in the budget, Speaker. We do not have uh, some sort of panic, as the person over there seems to think. What we have is the desire to get this information to the public so the public can figure out what is going on. Thank but you. I want to assure you, we use the auditors now. Thank you. Your question, the member from Hamilton Mountain. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, the Premier promised to be better, that she would ensure vulnerable children are a priority, but that has simply not been the case. Since September 18th, QP workers in Local 4914, representing child protection, administrative and support staff at PLCAS, have been on strike. Replacement workers are being paid outrageous amounts. No wonder there is distrust in the system. Will the Premier step up and ensure that PLCAS workers can get back to doing the important work they do for vulnerable children? <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I know that the Minister of Labour is going to want to, uh, to comment in the supplementary, but let me just say that I believe that negotiations have to be between the parties who are involved, Mr. Speaker, that the best deals are found at the table, Mr. Speaker, so I, I hope that both sides will, uh, will come together and will, uh, will find a way through the negotiation. That's the way the collective bargaining process works best, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, supplementary. Five. The buck stops with the Premier, Speaker. Ch children's aid workers should be protecting children instead of being forced to walk picket lines. Children need stability. The children's aid system definitely needs stability. Vulnerable children should be the priority of this government. Making sure that people who work with them are respected is a key part of that. When will the government stop making start when will, it, will they start making this about children in care and making sure that the people who provide the services are respected? Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, as a former president of a children's aid society in this province. I well understand what the speaker is talking about when she, she asks about these types of issues, but we should be proud of the labour relations record we have in the province of, the province of Ontario. Collective agreements are reached in well over 90 per cent of the disputes that take place. Collective agreements are reached without a resort to strike action. Speaker, when we reach an impasse, Speaker, Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. When we reach an impasse like we have in this, uh, in this regard, Speaker, we have some of the best arbitrators, we've got some of the best mediators, the best conciliators, Speaker, in the country that make themselves available to ensure that the parties are able to come to an agreement at the table, Speaker. The best That's agreements right. are reached at the collective agreement uh, at the bargaining table. I would urge the parties to get back to the table and strike Thank a deal. You. Question, the member from the Public Relature. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Advanced Education and Skills Development. This spring, our government made the exciting announcement that we're going to be making OSAP more generous for all students and actually making tuition free for low income students. Mr. Speaker, could the minister please give this House an update on what this government is doing to make free tuition a reality? Thank you. Minister. Um, 
of advanced education. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the question uh, from the member from Etobicoke Lakeshore. You know, when qualified students are prevented from attending post-secondary education because of cost, we all lose. We are all better off when all of us get the education that they can, Speaker. So that's why we're working hard to implement the most ambitious reform of student assistance in North America. I'm very for families under $50,000, but we're also supporting families that's progressive speaker, so up to $160,000 wow. family income, those students will still, still receive aid, improved upfront grant speaker. 150,000 students in Ontario will be getting grants that are higher than their tuition, we're getting free tuition. Speaker, so Answer. what we're saying to students is, you do the work, you get the marks, you get accepted. We'll make sure that money does not stand in the way of Thank our you. education. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for her answer. Generous financial assistance is so important to ensuring that underrepresented students are able to reach their full potential. However, we know that some low-income students never even apply for post-secondary education, let alone OSAP, because they assume the cost is too high. The, the sticker price of going to school can present a very real hurdle for low-income students and may have, who may have a hard time understanding what financial assistance they may be eligible for. Through you, Mr. Speaker, can the minister tell us what our government is doing to tell students about these changes? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker. And the, the member from Etobicoke Lakeshore is absolutely right. Yes, financial barriers can keep students from pursuing higher education, but the perception of high costs and the fear of taking on debt can be a roadblock in and of itself. And that's why we're working hard to spread the word about OSAP reform. We're going to college and university fairs. We're talking to guidance counselors. We're going around the province to make sure that young people understand what doors our new OSAP can open for them. Recently, I had the opportunity to tour the Ontario University Fair at the Metro Convention Centre. 130,000 people attended that weekend, Speaker. I visited the OSAP booth. I spoke to students. I spoke to parents. Staff manning that booth said it was the busiest they've ever been. People are excited about this. But I'm also asking MPPs from all sides of the House to make sure students Answer. in their ridings know that the doors of opportunity are open in Ontario. Thank you. Question the member from Elgin, Middlesex, Norman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Forestry. Speaker, after five years, four ministers, many FOIs, and conversations with the Ombudsman, I finally received some information regarding the special purpose account. As you know, Speaker, the money collected from hunters and anglers' licenses, royalties, and fines is to be used solely to improve hunting and fishing in Ontario. However, I was shocked to see the money collected from hunters and anglers was going to purchase houses and psychologists. Speaker, would the minister be able to explain to hunters and anglers of this province how buying homes and paying for psychologists improves angling and hunting in Ontario? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and I thank the member opposite for the uh, question today. I wanted to take this opportunity to thank the conservation officers who provide enforcement for our hunters and anglers and programs throughout Ontario. Thank you very much. The member is talking about the special purpose account for our fish and wildlife uh, programs. It costs about $100 million annually to pay for the fish and wildlife programs and services across Ontario. In 2015, the SPA, the special purpose account, gained $70 million and that goes to provide fish and wildlife management activities across Ontario. Some of those pieces talk about monitoring fish and wildlife possibility populations, fish culture and stocking, fish and wildlife Order. research management and planning, conservation of officers and enforcement, draws and licensing activities, and hunter education to support that across. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Minister. Speaker, the lack of transparency and details continues with this new minister. Speaker, each minister I've dealt with, four of them over the past five years, have tried to hide the truth about the expenditures and special purpose account. This summer, 
The Elmer District stakeholders received a response from the MNRF in regards to finding out details of the special purpose expenses in our area. The response they received from the ministry was they do not track expenditures for the Fish and Wildlife Special Purpose Account. What? However, the Financial Administration Act requires that re receipts and disbursements be recorded for special account purposes. We know they have the information for hunters and anglers. Speaker, will the minister now release the details outlining how monies from the special purpose account were spent and an explanation of how these monies have improved hunting and angling in Ontario? I, um, I'm not going to ask him to withdraw, but the member was uh, dangerously close to making an accusation that I cannot accept, so I would warn anyone after this point not to go down that road, please. Supplementary. I would have asked Thank you very much, question. Speaker. And again, I thank the member opposite for the supplementary question. Staff that is funded from the, the Fish and Wildlife Special Purpose Account include but are not limited to biologists, scientists, conservation officers, fish culture staff, field staff and administration staff. Expenditures related to staff salaries and benefits are paid through the Fish and Wildlife SPA for those staff performing fish and wildlife management activities across Ontario. There are directives and guidelines in place that govern benefits and staff relocation entitlements when required. We have a process within the ministry to review each year program costs within the ministry and the Fish and Wildlife SPA. It costs about, again, $100 million Answer. to pay for the Fish and Wildlife, but yet that, that member, when asked to pay for an increase in budget, voted against that budget. That Thank you. Order, please. Order, please. New question, the member from Kitchener Waterloo. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, this government has refused to give information to the Financial Accountability Officer. They have attacked and they have undermined uh, the Auditor General for this province repeatedly over the years. And now they have tabled the public accounts without the Auditor General's opinion for the first time ever. There is a pattern here, Speaker. This government is making the kind of history that leaves people deeply disappointed. Will the Premier admit that this was a mistake and work with the auditor to retable audited public accounts for the province of Ontario? Thank you. Thank you. The Board. President of the Treasury Board. I will be absolutely delighted to table the public accounts, but I cannot do that until we have an, an audit opinion from the auditor. That is why yesterday we released the fi consolidated financial statements in our annual report, which is the same financial information, uh, is because we are awaiting an, an opinion from the auditor. And I would point out uh, that we had, in fact, passed the deadline for the tabling of the public accounts last uh, on the 27th, and I am not able to table the public accounts until we have an opinion from the auditor. So when we get the opinion, when we get the opinion from the auditor, I will indeed table the public accounts. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, they have an opinion. They just don't like that opinion. Premier promised to have the most transparent and open government in Canada, but that's not what people are seeing. The government is trying to avoid accountability very clearly. By tabling financials without an audit, the Liberal government is releasing numbers that suit them, not the people of this province. We believe that the government should be about serving the people, not the interests of the Liberal Party. Will the Premier commit? to retabling the public accounts with the agreement of Ontario's nonpartisan Auditor General. So just let me restate 
I do not have a written opinion from the Auditor General. Once we have a written opinion from the Auditor General, I will be very happy to retable the accounts, and they will say what the consolidated financial statement said, which we released yesterday, which is that the province has beaten its deficit target for the seventh year in a row. We have projected an $8.5 billion deficit. In fact, we achieved a $5 billion deficit, and that that is in fact the Kitchener number Waterloo. that the Auditor General requested that we use is $5 billion. So in, by the, the Auditor's accounting, we achieved a $5 billion deficit, which is $3.5 billion dollars better than what we had projected in last year's budget. Thank you. Thank you. Question, the member from Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the minister responsible for accessibility. Mr. Speaker, one in seven people in Ontario have a disability, and this ratio is expected to increase to one in five over the next 20 years as our population ages. I speak regularly with constituents in my riding of Davenport about accessibility in Ontario. They come in all the time and tell me that while Ontario has made great progress, there is still a lot that we can do to remove barriers and increase accessibility for people with disabilities. Through the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act and Ontario's Action Plan, the government has made a commitment to make Ontario accessible by 2025. Mr. Speaker, can the minister share with the House some of the great work this government has done to move forward to make Ontario accessible by 2025? Thank you. Minister responsible for accessibility. Thank you, Speaker. And I want to thank the member from Davenport for this great question. October, as we know, is Disability Employment Awareness Month, and I will make a statement, a fuller statement, in the House this afternoon on that. I am happy to take this opportunity as Ontario's first minister responsible for accessibility to share with the House what makes Ontario a leader in accessibility. Through our AODA and our action plan, we are building on our strengths and sharpening our focus to engage businesses and promote cultural shifts. We've launched a marketing campaign focused on raising awareness of the employment standard for employers, and later this year, Speaker, we'll be releasing our provincial employment strategy for people with disabilities. As well, we completed the first ever review of the customer service standard and initiated the review of the transportation standard, which is currently underway, Speaker, Answer. and I'm happy to share more in the supplementary. So thank you for the minister, uh, to the minister for sharing this information with the House. It is great to hear that this government sees the value and importance of making Ontario accessibility accessible for all. I hear from my constituents all the time, from both business owners and customers, about opportunities they have missed because of the barriers people with disabilities face. One of my constituents, Sharon, uses an electric scooter and visits my office regularly. She recently told me that when a business is accessible, not only do customers with disabilities serve to gain, but the business benefits as well. While we know that organizations who make their services accessible gain a competitive advantage, unfortunately, many organizations are unaware of this great opportunity. Can the minister explain how the government is engaging with businesses and business owners to understand the value and importance of becoming accessible? Thank you, Minister. Thank you. I want to thank the member again for the question. We know that for business, being an accessible speaker is not just the right thing to do, but it's a smart thing to do. Reports have shown that the global market represents 1.3 billion people with disabilities and their 2.3 billion family members, friends, caregivers, and colleagues. That amounts to $8 trillion speaker of disposable income globally that some businesses are unfortunately missing out because of the lack of accessibility. Greater accessibility in Ontario, of course, means greater opportunity for all. We're raising awareness through campaigns, we're engaging in public uh, education and providing support for businesses, and of course, regularly conducting compliance, compliance inspection audits. 
We're working to sure, ensure they're not only compliant with the law, but to help businesses see the value of being compliant as well. And we recognize Thank the importance you. of making our province fully accessible. Right Thank you. Question, Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. We've been listening to the Minister of Energy lauding your hydro rebate plan for rural Ontario, where farmers have been especially hit hard by increasing electricity bills. Mr. Speaker, farms run on energy, and energy rates are one of the most expensive input costs for our farmers. Yet the minister is telling farmers that off-peak is the ideal time to use electricity. And I quote, just farm during off-peak hours and you'll save money, lots of money, a third of your bill. So my question for the premier is, how can she explain just how her time of use prices would be of any use to a farmer? Well, thank Economic you so much, Mr. Speaker. Growth. I'm delighted to respond to the member's question because it's yet another example, Mr. Speaker, of the chameleon-like tendencies of the new uh, PC party. One minute they're telling us, Mr. Speaker, that we should be uh, trying to find ways to lower energy rates. We come in with a rebate program that provides 8% across the board for, for users, small business users, farmers, and others. And in rural parts of the province, Mr. Speaker, much more than that. And, Mr. Speaker, all we get from the member opposite is critique and criticism. Mr. Speaker, we've responded to some of the concerns of our farmers. I know our Minister of Agriculture listens very closely to the concerns our farmers raise. And, Mr. Speaker, we've brought in, put in place a program that will provide significant discounts on energy costs for our farmers and for residents right across the province. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm going to go back to the Premier again. Mr. Speaker, I think the Premier is coming to realize that her Liberal Protection Plan for Ontario Farmers is moot. Cheaper rates would be a serious game-changer for farmers. The Ontario Federation of Agriculture has told you that affordable energy could free up more than $1 billion a year of new disposable income for rural Ontarians to invest in and build our rural economy. But maybe the Premier and her minister know better. So I ask her, how does she imagine getting Ontario's 360,000 dairy cows to give milk during off-peak hours? <laughs> Mr. Speaker, refer this to the Minister of Agriculture. Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. And I... <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the uh, supplementary for the, the member this morning. In effect, it's interesting enough. Uh, you know, I always read the commentary for the Ontario. Now I'll stand. The member from Renfrew come to order. Minister. Well, thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, I read the, I read the very articulate time. commentary from the Ontario Federation of Agriculture. We have the uh, president, in, uh, president of gallery today, and it's interesting when our colleague, the Minister of Energy, announced the program. There was a very positive commentary from the Ontario Federation of Agriculture. In fact, by, by reducing the threshold level of the ICI. There will be more farm businesses in the province of Ontario that can take advantage of that program, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. And the question the member from Temiskaming, Cochrane. Thank you, Speaker. Farmers are the foundation of our huge agricultural sector. 750,000 jobs depend on farmers. The risk management program was designed by farmers to, to ensure them against the boom and bust cycles in agriculture. The Liberal government capped who, please? the program. I didn't hear who. The Liberal who, government. No, who, who you are. Oh, the, I said to the Premier, but. I, sorry. sorry, I didn't hear. Oh, sorry. Premier. The Liberal government capped the program in the boom. But since 2012, farm gate prices for corn, wheat, beef, and pork have plummeted by half. Min Premier, will you lift the cap on the risk management program to help protect farmers from the oncoming bust? Thank you. I can touch your food and Thanks, Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I do uh, I do appreciate the uh, the question for the member from Tabiskaway Carquin, of course, who's been a uh, agriculture leader in the Northeast Ontario. The fact of the matter is, Mr. Speaker, it was a predecessor of mine, Carol Mitchell, that canvassed broadly to all commodity groups that are not covered by supply management in the province of Ontario. It was this government that brought in a risk management program, the only province in Canada, Mr. Speaker, that has such a program. We did so to help our farmers to, to alleviate the challenges that they have, uh, prices that are determined by the Chicago Exchange, to level the playing field, to give them support, 
The $100 million program is a place to do it. And my recollection is, Mr. Speaker, we got no support for the opposition benches when that was in our budget. Oh, Thank you. Once again, to the Premier, the fact of the matter is that program was designed by farmers and the government to be bankable and predictable, but then the government capped it. So it's no longer bankable and predictable. The fact of the matter is thousands of jobs rely on the stability of the, of the farm community. Because as farmers get economically squeezed, they are, processors can't rely on their products because they might not be there. The government expects farmers to be stewards of the land with all their environmental rules, yet they don't come through with the programs that actually help farmers survive. Once again, will this government remove the cap to maintain the stability in the agriculture sector so we can retain the thousands, the hundreds of thousands of jobs that sector creates. You see that, please? You see that, please? Thank you. Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member for his supplementary. The fact of the matter is we brought this program when Carol Mitchell, uh, predecessor of mine, was here. The reason we did so Mr. Speaker, it's because farmers in Ontario that are not covered by supply management wanted stability in their industry. We want to get away from ad hoc programs. So this government, of course, uh, had extensive uh, consultation with the non-supply management group in place. We brought in a risk management program for Ontario farmers that's bankable and predictable to make sure we can address uh, those concerns like we've had this past summer when parts of Ontario had unprecedented Answer. drought. I was in the field meeting with those farmers to make sure that they knew that our program, risk management program, was a place, Mr. Thank Speaker, you. to help them. Hey, hey. New question? The member from Perth Wellington, sorry. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Community and Social Services. It's about the families in crisis and many more on the brink. They don't have the services they need to care for their adult children with developmental disabilities. Some families have no funding at all. Many are left sitting on wait lists. The Ombudsman's report concluded that the government response to their plight was unreasonable and wrong. The minister knows how important this is, there was, yet there was no mention of services for individuals with developmental disabilities in the throne speech. And why not, Speaker? And when will the government's response improve to something better than what the Ombudsman defines as unreasonable and wrong? Thank you. <laughs> Minister of Social Community well, and Social Services. Thank you very Services. much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question, because it gives me the opportunity to say how much I respect the individuals with dis developmental disabilities in this province, their families, their caregivers, and the the challenges that they in fact face. And certainly uh, the comments made by the Ombudsman I found to be entirely unacceptable. And this is why we're working so hard to ensure that no individual uh, is left in unacceptable circumstances. And this is why on this side of the House we're working so very hard. Uh, many ministries are involved to ensure that we have seamless service for these individuals. So my colleagues, the Minister of Children and Youth, the Minister of Education, Education and I are particularly engaged in this file. And this, of course, is why we have uh, shown our commitment Answer. to those with developmental disabilities. We are now spending some $2.11 billion per year on this particular sector. Thank you, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Thank you, Speaker. I'm sure the minister is sincere, but the government continues pushing families to the brink of crisis before they take notice. The Hintz family, who I represent, is one example. We appreciate the minister's interest, but this family has endured months of stress and uncertainty. The Forty family also needs help. Lucas Forty needs passport funding, but he's been on the wait list for over a year. When Lucas turned 18, his funding stopped. Even though he is the same person with the same needs he was the day before. Now he has to use his ODSP check for all of his needs. What will the minister do for, the Lucas, for Lucas and his family? And why did this government still say happy 18th birthday by cutting off services 
to those with exceptional needs. Question. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And of course, I cannot comment on individual cases in this House. But having said that, I want to assure every member that if they become aware of urgent situations, I and my ministry officials are anxious to look into the situation and look at any possible avenue of support. And having said that, I do want to uh, reiterate that our government did, in fact, introduce a budget uh, that included $810 million for the sector over three years, uh, a budget that was voted against, in fact, by the opposition members. Uh, and uh, These funds have been put to exceptionally good use. We're now supporting some 42,000 individuals with developmental disabilities, direct funding for passport now to more than 19,000 individuals, Answer. and we're currently supporting some 18,000 individuals wow. re for residential supports. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. The member from Kenora, Lady River. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. According to Statistics Canada, there are about 1.8 million people who live in rural Ontario. The Premier has told Ontarians and rural Ontarians that they will see an additional 12 per cent in average savings off their hydro bill from an enhanced rural rate relief program. But as it turns out, only 330,000 rural customers will see the extra savings, including non-residential customers. When will the government tell the people in Kenora Rainy River how many of them will be getting 20 per cent off their hydro bills and how many won't? The Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the changes that we made are going to provide $110 million of support and relief to rural and remote customers. And, Mr. Speaker, that information was put forward when the minister made the announcement. So it, it was very clear to those residents, Mr. Speaker, as to where it applies and where it doesn't. And, Mr. Speaker, I know that the, the ministers work very, very uh, closely with, with communities to identify where where this applies and where it doesn't. But at the end of the day, Mr. Speaker, every resident in Ontario gets an 8% discount off their bill. That's where it starts. 8% off their bill, significant rebate, Mr. Speaker. We heard, heard very, uh, very much from residents, and, they, and we've responded. We know that there are challenges in rural Ontario as well. Yes, and we know, Mr. Speaker, that we've responded to that, because depending on where they're at, whether they're in remote communities or not, They'll be getting up to 20% off their bill, which Thank is you. good news for rural uh, residents. Thank you, Speaker. New regulations will force local utilities to start adding special government messaging about the rural rate relief on their hydro bills. But you can bet that those bills won't mention that most northern and rural Ontarians are not getting the full 12% savings in the rural rate relief. And they need relief. One woman in my riding recently wrote to me about the out-of-control hydro rates. She said, quote, My husband is on disability. My goal now is to work until 70 and then drop dead, end quote, because she simply can't afford to pay her hydro bill. And too many others in Kenora Rainy River are literally being driven out of the province because of the high hydro rates. When will the Premier tell us how many people in Kenora Rainy River will actually get the full 12 per cent in rural rate relief, and how many people will just get Question. another high bill with government spin? Good Mr. Speaker, as I said before, the new regulation includes an additional $110 million of support for rural and remote residents. Mr. Speaker, it's very important that we do that, and it does depend on, on whether they're in an urban area or a rural area. Mr. Speaker, and those, those rules have been outlined, and Mr. Speaker, they'll have to work through that to determine where, where in fact those residents live. But we've been very clear about it. Residents right across this province get about an 8% uh, get an 8, an 8 uh, discount. We've, uh, we've heard, we've responded. Mr. Speaker, we're ensuring that those residents get a break on their energy bills. Mr. Speaker, I think that's what the people of this province expect, and I think they'll be very pleased to get that. It'd be nice if the NDP were positive about it. Thank you, Mr. Thank Speaker. Thank you. The member from Kingston and the Islands. 
Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Labour. Often when we think of occupational injuries, we think of those that cannot be seen by looking at a person, a cut or a broken bone. Over the course of the last few years, we have heard more about all sorts of injuries that can occur in workplaces that we cannot spot by simply looking at someone. Mental health is an example of this. Another example are pains and strains or MSDs, musculoskeletal disorders, exactly the type of work being researched at, by Dr. Rainbow and his team at the state-of-the-art high-speed skeletal imaging laboratory at Queen's University. These injuries can be debilitating and impact Ontarians from working to their full potential or Question. even at all. Can the minister please share with the House what the Ministry of Labour is doing to prevent MSDs in Ontario workplaces? Thank you, Minister of Labour. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Kingston, the Islands, for her tremendous advocacy when it comes to occupational health and Real good member, health and safety. Time. Speaker, and she's correct. Not all the illnesses, not all the injuries that take place in the workplace are actually ones that we can see. Speaker, everyday workers in this province use their muscles, their tendons, their ligaments, their joints. They lift, they carry, they sit, they stand. They move in a variety of ways. Speaker, in order to do the work in the job they have. Sometimes that can put a little bit too much demand on your body, can cause pain, discomfort, but it can lead to more serious injuries, Speaker, and it can lead to something called MSD. October is the, uh, the month that we, we, uh, we recognize ergonomics, Speaker. Wow. Our, uh, at the Ministry of Labour, our health and safety partners will be raising awareness of MSDs right throughout the province of Ontario. So, Speaker, I want to take this opportunity yes, to encourage employers and workers to take part in these planned activities. It's going to prevent injuries, Speaker. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member from Elgin, Middlesex, London has given notice of his dissatisfaction with an answer to his question given by the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Concerning expenditures on the special purpose account, this matter will be debated today at 6 p.m. We have a deferred vote on the motion of closure and the motion of second reading of Bill No. 2. Call on the members. This will be a five-minute bill.
members, please take your seats. All members, please take your seats. Thank you. On September the 21st, 2016, Mr. Nackvi moved second reading of Bill 2, an act to amend various statutes with respect to election matters. Mr. Duguid has moved that the question be now put. All those in favour of Mr. Duguid's motion, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Duguid. Mr. Duguid. Mr. Duguid. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Nackvi. Mr. Nackvi. Mr. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Barnett. Mr. Barnett. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Meridi. Mr. Meridi. Mr. Hunter. Mr. Hunter. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Codry. Mr. Codry. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Ms. Manga. Ms. Manga. Mr. Kraft. Mr. Kraft. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Ms. Darmelon. Ms. Darmelon. Ms. McGarry. Ms. McGarry. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassic. Ms. Jassic. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Ms. Albanese. Ms. Albanese. Ms. McMahon. Ms. McMahon. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Ms. Naidu Harris. Ms. Naidu Harris. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hope. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martins. Mrs. Martins. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Vernil. Ms. Vernil. All those opposed, please rise one more time to be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Hardeman. Mr. Hardeman. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Miller Perry Sam Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sam Muskoka. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. McNaughton. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Ms. Monroe. Ms. Monroe. Mr. Yur. Mr. Yur. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Ms. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Ms. DeNovo. Ms. DeNovo. Mr. Tavins. Mr. Tavins. Mr. Miller, Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller, Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sapp. Ms. Sapp. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Madame Jelena. Madame Jelena. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Ms. Campbell. Ms. Campbell. Ms. Mr. Monta. Mr. Monta. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Ms. Gretzky. Ms. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. The ayes being 51, the nays being 40, I declare the motion carried. Mr. Nackvi has moved a second reading of Bill 2, an act to amend various statutes with respect to election matters. Is it the pleasure of the House the motion carry? I heard a no. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. All those opposed to the motion, please say nay. In my opinion, the ayes have it. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bill. Just move. 
Mr. Nackley has moved second reading of Bill 2, an act to amend various statutes with respect to election matters. All those in favour of the motion, please rise. One at a time, be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Dugan. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Barardnetti. Mr. Barardnetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Caudry. Mr. Caudry. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Ms. Manga. Ms. Manga. Mr. Kraft. Mr. Kraft. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Ms. Dahmer. Ms. Dahmer. Ms. McGarry. Ms. McGarry. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassy. Ms. Jassy. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Ms. Albanese. Ms. Albanese. Ms. McGarry. Ms. Ms. McMahon. Ms. McMahon. Mr. Ball. Mr. Ball. Ms. Nidu Harris. Ms. Nidu Harris. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Ms. Marley. Ms. Marley. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Vernil. Ms. Vernil. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Hardy. Mr. Hardy. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Brown. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Fidel. Mr. Fidel. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Miller Perry Sam Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sam Muskoka. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Ms. Monroe. Ms. Monroe. Mr. Yurk. Mr. Yurk. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipee. Mr. Pettipee. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Van. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Nova. Mr. Nova. Mr. Tab. Mr. Tab. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sapper. Ms. Sapper. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Nattasha. Mr. Nattasha. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Madame Jelly. Madame Jelly Nap. Ms. Campbell. Ms. Campbell. Ms. Yermonta. Mr. Yermonta. Mr. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Ms. Gretzky. Ms. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Those opposed, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. The ayes being 91, the nays being zero, I declare the motion carried. Second reading of the bill, Digium Lecture Projet de Loi. Shall the bill be ordered for third reading? Government House Leader, Minister, Attorney General. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, General Government, Standing Committee on General Government. So be it. There are no deferred votes. No further deferred votes. This House stands recess until 3 p.m. this afternoon.